Now as we continue to discover this woman, the mystery of her is being revealed. So I want to continue. We left off where she now sits on the beast with seven heads, ten horns. You know this beast, we've talked extensively about this beast uh, from the book of uh, Daniel, um, the seventh chapter. We, we saw this beast. It was one of four beasts, four great beasts. Uh, the preceding three, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and then this beast with seven heads. He was given the addition of ten horns in, uh, in the book of Revelation, the 13th chapter, which said, The beast I saw came up out of the sea of nations, arising out of humanity, as it were, uh, that pressed down, oppressed, crushed, devoured the whole earth, which means it subjugated the populations of the earth. And it appears that it did so by two measures. Number one, you couldn't make war against it. And number two, you couldn't buy or sell without its permission. It, di- it does have, this beast, it does have ten horns. When we're, when we're presented first with it, in Daniel 7, only the mention of seven heads. But Revelation 13, an addition, it has ten horns. Now Revelation 17, it has a, it has a woman sitting on it. The ten horns was covered with blasphemous names. We know that one of the the ten horns that came up, and the ten horns are ten kings, like the seven heads are seven systems over which ten kings rule. So it's a global kingdom. And because of that, it's not bound by geography, And because it has ten kings, it is not a unitary kingdom in the traditional sense of kings and kingdoms. But because it exerts control by the restriction of commerce and the threat of war and violence, it is an ideological kingdom, systemically based. more real in its ability to subjugate the whole earth than any uh, traditional kingdom ever thought of being. Now, the bifurcation of its rule into ten kings gives it a a more complete uh, oversight and rule than any other kingdom before it. And the rule of these ten kings over seven systems allows them to perfect the rule by simply coordinating the effects of these seven, king, seven systems. These systems contain everything necessary for human life. Now, when we speak of these things, we're speaking of the end of the age. These things have had their antecedents throughout human history, but when we come down to the end of the age, we have an amalgamation of these systems. And the woman sits on them and consorts with the kings. There is a similarity of philosophy between the horn, the little horn that was given a mouth to speak and spoke blasphemously against the Most High 
and against the saints. Now listen to what Jesus said. He said, and this would be from Matthew 24, chapters, uh, Matthew 24, verses 13 through, thir- verse 3 through verse 14. He says, And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will arise and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of most will become cold. But he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now before that, he says, Take heed that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not deceived or not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation, and I mentioned this before, ethnos, nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against people, and there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. These are the beginnings of sorrows. They'll deliver you up to tribulation to kill you, and you'll be hated by all the nations on account of my name. Now, the facilitator of this oppression of the saints is this beast. We know that from Daniel 7, which says, and and again from uh, Revelation 13, identifying the same beast, one one referencing only that it has seven heads, the other referencing it has seven heads and ten horns, and now a third referencing that the woman sits on it. There is a coordinated effort, there is a, there is a similarity of message and culture between the woman who sits on the beast and the blasphemies spoken uh, by the little horn which tells us whatever is in anything that, that has the capacity to speak, whenever it speaks it will tell you the nature of what's in it. So because they're blasphemies spoken by this little horn, and these blasphemies are against the Most High, against the saints, now we have the woman sitting on the beast, giving legitimacy to the beast in the eyes of the global population, and therefore she becomes party to this abominable practice of subjugating the whole earth to the rule of Satan, because Satan gives his power, his throne, and great authority to the beast. No wonder the identity of this woman has been kept hidden, because it is a co-conspirator and co-actor with the very essence of the activities of Satan in the earth and falls perfectly in line with what Scripture has said from the very beginning that the the seed of the serpent will bruise the heel of the son, but the, the, the seed of the woman will bruise the head, will crush the head of the serpent. So finding her sitting on the beast, the woman is sitting on the beast. Now, to appear to give the legitimacy of the son she bore to the beast. Now, who wants the identity of the son that the woman bore? The very one who opposes him, the anti-Messiah. So the scheme 
is to deceive the nations and the woman has a part in it. Because if she's the same woman who bore the son who is seated on the throne, then whoever she says is her son, she has the inside track on identifying the son. So the false, the false Messiah will arise to the acclaim of the false church. That's her real use. And in exchange for her harlotry, she's dressed like royalty and made excessively rich. So what, what do we know is the nascent character, the hidden to be revealed but very present character of the false church? We know that it loves power and we know that it craves wealth and we know that it is rebellious and disobedient. Now all these things are considered, quote, here it is, she has a cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. She holds aloft the celebratory chalice. This is not a cup with the blood of the saints. Let's make that distinction right now. The woman is drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs. She's drunk with that. She has a bloodlust, but that's the bloodlust of jealousy. That's where you want to kill anything that challenges your lies. So in this time, those who are deceived in the world will evince the, be the behavior of brother against brother, where man's enemies will be they of his own household. Because the work of the harlot is to sow enmity just like Satan himself sowed enmity between God and Adam, a father and a son, between Adam and Eve, a husband and a wife, and between Cain and Abel, brother against brother. And in every case, the extent of loss was tragic. How are we going to see these things operational in the day in which we live? You know, we're seeing these things, but a population has become blind to what they're seeing. Seeing they see not. Hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. We watched recently, and we, we're all sort of deadened, I suppose, to front page tabloid news routinely. But God will always choose, God will always choose the most conspicuous examples of a thing in order to reveal its nature to us. So what would qualify as perhaps the most conspicuous examples of things that reflect brother against brother? Well, it was Peter the Great who coined the phrase Russian. 
to distinguish between the people of Russia and the people of Ukraine, but they're the same people. In fact, Ukraine claims that they were the mother culture of Russia and the site uh, for their uh, for support that Prince Vladimir of the Rus uh, of Kiev or Kiev, we call it Kiev in the West, they call it Kiev in Ukraine, was essentially the founder of both uh, Ukraine and Russia. And for a long time, these were tribal societies amalgamated under these rulers. And yet the stated policy of uh, not Volodymyr, but Vladimir, which is the same name, one is, uh, and it's interesting that we should have Volodymyr uh, as the, uh, the leader of, of the Ukrainian people and Vladimir the leader of the Russian people. It couldn't be more obvious that brother has turned against brother. But if that requires you to know a little bit of history um, and you're not inclined to, to exercise the, the curiosity to recognize that this is a war of brother against brother, look more personally to the two sons of the English king, the newly crowned monarch, William and Harry. Uh, these, these miserable wretches of privilege have engaged the public spectacle of a family dispute. And you know the, the English are trying to keep the lid on it, and one understands why. But the world's appetite for the brothers fighting, literally fighting with each other, according to the report of the one who published the report about it. The picture of brother against brother. characterizes uh, the end of the age because, and by the way, where is the English church in all of this? And these are the, this is, the, this is their royal family, heads by designation of the English church. Um, church is impotent reduced to crowning a king without power and his consort, now known as Queen, who originally adulterously consorted with him while he was yet married to the mother of these two fighting siblings. I mean, do we have to be hit in the, in the face with a mop to not understand that these are the things spoken of in Scripture, brother turning against brother. The spirit of an impotent church allows for there to be no restraint of godliness upon people intimately associated with church in its various forms, whether it's Russian, English, American. In America, I was reading the tragic report the other day of how in families, evangelical families, the younger generation is being separated from the older generation over Donald Trump. Brother against brother. Families split down the middle. People aren't talking to each other. The, 
when the church becomes a harlot, and it has become a harlot, its preoccupation is with the conservation of power and wealth, nothing else. It is not a peacemaker. It's part of the problem. <laughs> and we, we have an army of prophets here in America who have been firmly identified with the culture of the harlot and are in total support of people's desire for security and well-being. Look, I'm trying to sound an alarm, but I suppose the only people who can hear it are those who are not of the darkness and not of the night when the thief has come. She's, she has a cup of her adulteries. She's, it's a celebratory cup of all of the results, what she's gained by her fornication. And it's called all of her wealth, all of her splendor, all of its, her accomplishments are called, quote, the filthiness of her fornication. I've been seeing advance reports of how in this great falling away, unsurprisingly, and I'm calling it the great falling away, I'm telling you that now we, are, we aren't at the beginning of a great falling away, we're in the midst of it and it'll become increasingly radicalized and extreme. Now it's gone to Christian nationalism, which is essentially white nationalism. People claiming this is our country, God gave this to us and they've, they've long conflated America with the Kingdom of God. How could anyone simultaneously claim to be a believer and believe in Christian nationalism, which is at the core racist? You say, what do you mean people can choose? Yes, it's the choice that the woman makes in the wilderness that causes her to become the harlot. Look, the message of Christ is this, from beginning to end the message of Christ is this, that God is in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not counting men's sins against them. The promise of the Messiah was always this, that of every tribe, tongue, language, and nation, he would form one holy nation, one holy people. His last prayer, Father, let them be one in us, in the manner in which we are one. You are in me, I am in you, let them be one in us, so that the world might believe that you sent me and have loved them like you love me. No, no, no message of evangelism can succeed now in this mixture, in this toxic mixture because the harlot church has become identified with a single people group and as such, it cannot, it's not that it does not, it cannot carry out the mandate of Christ to go into all the world, preach the good news to every, crea every creature and train them up to become one holy nation, one royal priesthood. There is no message of evangelism left 
in the church. I don't care what, what, how many weeks of purpose you have and teach about. This message has been arrested because it's been contextualized in the language of the harlot, which suits the purpose of the beast on which she sits. How do we suppose that she may exert any independence from the beast when her imperatives are her provision and her protection? What's astonishing to me is people still think that because certain of these religious figures started out well, that everything they say has continued to be faithful to the mandate of Christ. That's the point I'm making. You may start out well. I think of some of the leaders of the Jesus movement all these years back, sitting in the front row now of rallies. One of them even got COVID at a rally for Donald Trump, who has divided the church. Look, if you don't keep going, the harlot did not keep going, did not keep pursuing union and fellowship with Christ. If you don't keep doing that, at some point you'll believe you're famous enough that you want to cash in on your fame. And there'll be plenty of people who love the adornment of a prostitute because of the promise, the adornment of a prostitute, because of the promise of personal acclaim. We watch that happen to some of the greatest evangelical leaders. They couldn't, they could not and would not separate themselves from the lure, the siren call of the political leadership, even of this nation and turned a blind eye to things God was doing in order to maintain the favor of kings and in the end were disgraced by it. Yes, I understand that people are sentimental and don't call it as it is, but that won't do in this hour that is characterized by lying and deception. Nobody knows what the truth is anymore. This is why this is a message that calls us to return to the person of the truth, not to Bible verses that you can distort to suit whatever thing you want to purport. This is a calling back to the standard and measure of the person of Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm Sam Solon. We'll continue to unpack this. See you then. Bye bye. May mercy, grace, and peace be with you always. Thank you for watching.